Uh, if you ask people what the most important thing in Christianity is, a good number of people are going to say the resurrection, right? Makes sense. It's hard to argue with that. It's the moment when the work of Jesus culminates to show his earthly ministry and his death wasn't in vain, right? We celebrate it during Easter. It's one of the few holy days that the Puritans recognized. They hated Christmas. They pretty much banned it. Uh, Christmas gets the good press in the world and the movies of the resurrection of just aren't really there to be found. Christmas gets the highest point. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the moment us Christians recognize, and it's the big moment of everything laid the foundation for that. But can we be confident? Can we be confident it happened? And how can we have confidence that it took place? Well, but first we have to find out before we get to the end of the story, we have to figure out why we got here. Why did Jesus have to die in order to be resurrected in the first place? So we all know the story. Adam and Eve, fruit, snake, right? But in uh, Genesis 3, 16, we see the first gospel message put in place. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There is the first reminder of hope that Adam and Eve have even before they find out their own punishment. Then comes the even worse news. In Adam, we all take part in sin, right? Romans 5, 12, and 14, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. Right? If you're going through the Romans road, this sounds familiar. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam was the first man, and there is going to be a second man who fulfills the roles that he failed at. So what are the consequences of sin? We all know this one, too. Romans 6.23, the wages, the things, the payments that we get for doing the things that we want to do that are according to our nature, is death. And it not only affects us, but the entire creation, so the simple sin of disobedience affects our relationship with God, where he is forced to expel us from his presence and his blessing and his promises. But the repercussions reach to our animal friends, to the trees, even to the stars in the Orion Star Nebula. But the story doesn't end in chapter 3 of Genesis. God preserves a remnant and offers promises where he will write his law on our hearts. He will change our hearts from hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, and the hatred towards him will have a beating heart to live and work for him. How does God remind his people to be on the lookout for the coming promised one? And also to remind them of the direct impact sin requires. Well, there you have the uh, sacrificial uh, uh, system uh, codified. And we have to think about here when it's established. It's rooted in the uh, Passover sacrifice. We talked about that if you were here for my talk uh, a couple weeks ago. God uses the blood and death of the spotless lamb to not visit death upon the Hebrews. And then Jesus ties that in with the Last Supper. But from there, the temple sacrifices are codified. They're established. And think about the impact that this should have on the people. You, you're with your father. You've uh, found this uh, innocent lamb. You've either brought him up or you've purchased it for a decent price. It's innocent, unblemished. Your family has laid hands on it to signify a transfer of your sins to it. You stand in line as the priest slit the throat of the lamb and sprinkled the blood on the altar. You look up and down the line, right? And you see thousands of people with their own lamb waiting in line, each one with their perfect spotless lamb. There has to be a better way, right? The high priest, the only one who is able to walk to, into the innermost portion of the tent and meetings, the Holy of Holies. A rope is tied around his ankle or his waist in case he were to suddenly die and the other people couldn't go to retrieve them because they have not been specially cleansed to enter before the presence of God. Something we're gonna look, we look forward to in post-resurrection. And year after year, lamb after lamb, slaughter after slaughter, rebellion after rebellion, and sin after sin, he takes part, the high priest takes part in the slaughtering of the innocence of the wicked. He looks upon the stains on that altar year after year and sees 
and asks, there's got to be a better way. The sacrifices aren't there to take away sin. The hoping of the coming Messiah is what saves. A righteous heart that produces good deeds is what is desired. Prophecies are made of the Messiah, the coming one. Qualities and characteristics are foretold. He is going to be both a son, but also God. How is that possible? But also, why is that needed? Just as the sacrificial system was established, the blood of bulls and goats didn't take away sin. Only a perfect sacrifice of one to represent mankind was needed. So a fully human being who was fully perfect would have to be in place. But even before the birth, we are conceived in sin. And our lives are evidence that sin is transmitted to us. And on top of that, he's going to have to be so powerful that he withstands the full wrath of God while taking upon all the sins of his people they committed, are committing, and will ever commit until the new heavens and the new earth come. He needs to be fully God. So yes, the resurrection is important. It is the proof that God the Father finds the sacrifice of the fully man and fully God perfect, and his sacrifice is also perfect. But we are unable to piecemeal things away from the Christian religion and boil it down only to the resurrection. But it is important. So let's go into the purpose of this talk. And I'm skipping a lot, right? Like how the proof of the resurrection is not where I'd start with people who I'm talking to about the reliability of Christianity. Again, it is important, and I'm sure it's going to come up in the conversation, but I'm going to figure out how we both can claim something as proof. And to do so, we'd both have to present our worldviews in which we look at life and all objects for evidence and see if we have explanatory power in that worldview. But when when it comes to historical evidence, especially 2,000 years of all sorts of people trampling over our crime scene, it makes it really hard to point to a spot with our magnifying glass and go, aha, here it is, proof. On top of that, we're looking for not a body, right? But we can do that today. I was just watching a trial from uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, where a man was recently convicted of murder for uh, a crime that uh, they claim that he he, uh, committed, and there was no body, there was no murder weapon, but he was still convicted. Uh, but we do have a story where a body appeared again. So that's helpful, right? And so uh, we move on to uh, looking at the uh, evidences for the, the uh, resurrection. And if you want to know more about this, I'm going to plug my channel a couple times because everyone needs a podcast these days. But uh, uh, Tony and I, Tony Gavan, uh, if you remember him, uh, he and I interviewed Jay Warner Wallace for our podcast. And you can go and find those interviews for the resurrection of Jesus at com slash dragnet. Dragnet's an old TV show that was really popular back in the day, so that's why we chose it for him. All right, so because the resurrection is a historical event and not one where we can do scientific testing on, we have to resort to the same pro- process we establish proof of other events of history, and that's taking eyewitnesses and their testimony of the event and looking for the internal consistent explanation that fits the facts. <clears throat> But one thing also doesn't, uh, we don't want to pass over, is that we're not sitting here as only naturalists, right? We don't just throw up our hands to the sky and says, this is all there is. This is all I'm able to do uh, and see available to us. We aren't casting the dice down and saying nothing can be known about the outcome of these dice until they come to rest. We do have the internal conviction of the Holy Spirit. We are living in a post-resurrection, post-Pentecost world. And so God saves us through his calling to us at the time of place he chose before the foundation of the world and has placed his spirit in our hearts so that we are able to follow him. And that spirit testifies to us of the truth of the resurrection. But it's also not to say we are to close our eyes to the world around us. After all, whose creation is it? It's God's creation, right? And so all truth is God's truth. All things are the Lord's. And so we can look to the whole world and see. You can't use, uh, the, the claim is you can't use the Bible because it has supernatural elements. Well, you mean like the resurrection of a guy who claims to be fully God and fully man? That's, that's the whole argument. The whole argument is supernatural. That's, that's the point. Plus, in a world where a random chance dictates our every action, why is uh, it not fully believable to, for it just to happen that one guy who died didn't suddenly pop back up into existence? And C.S. Lewis wrote about this very uh, presuppositionally in his book, Miracles. He says this, he says, quote, For this reason, the question whether miracles occur can never be answered simply by experience. 
Every event which might claim to be a miracle is, in the last resort, something presented to our senses, something seen, heard, touched, smelled, or tasted. And our senses are not infallible. If anything extraordinary seems to have happened, we can always say that we have been the victims of an illusion. If we hold a philosophy which excludes the supernatural, this is what we always shall say. What we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to the experience. It is therefore useless to appeal to the experience before we have settled, as well as can be, the philosophical question. And one last caveat. This isn't everything. I'm not going to deal with all the counterclaims and the counter-counterclaims. I'm also leaving out conversations about reliability of the Bible and taking for granted that Jesus existed, even though a majority of scholars, um, more than a majority of scholars, believe that he did. Um, this is more to show the avenues that you can take to have confidence in the resurrection and confidence, confide, with fide, fidelism, with faith. How do we have confidence in the resurrection?